It's a huge honor to have been selected for the Talent of 12. It, I'm extremely grateful you know, to have been selected for the people that nominated me and who have um, helped me along the way. Uh, so before I get into the chemistry, I just want to give a quick overview of who I am. So I'm a native of Iowa, uh, born 34 years ago in beautiful Iowa. Um, so after high school, I didn't really know what to do. So I started at community college and then transferred to the University of uh, Northern Iowa, where I was initially pre-med. And it was the organic chemistry class that I took that really sparked my interest and led me to switch my career to chemistry. And I was fortunate enough to do some uh, really nice undergraduate research uh, with Martin Chin, who was an excellent advisor, and he encouraged me uh, to do a PhD. Uh, so I followed his uh, sage advice. And I did my PhD with John Hartwig uh, at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. I did various things, mostly around uh, fluorine and <clears throat> fluorinated functional groups with copper. And it was during my PhD that I also became interested in process chemistry, specifically in the pharmaceutical sector. And I got a little taste of that by developing a multi kilo scale synthesis of what John termed uh, the trifluoromethylator, which is shown in the top right there. So this was commercialized uh, through several vendors. And then in uh, 2015, I was fortunate enough to land my dream job and start as a process chemist at Merck in Rahway, New Jersey, uh, where I've been ever since. And really the highlight of my career has been um, uh, the work I did last year and this year as a process chemistry lead for Molnupiravir, which is Merck's uh, oral antiviral for COVID-19, which I'll get to uh, at the end of the talk. You know, so as a process chemist in the pharmaceutical sector, the types of molecules that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis look like the one shown here. So there's a lot of Lewis basic heteroatoms or sensitive functionality and complex physical chemical properties. And a few functional groups that are particularly prevalent are phenols, pyridines, and sulfonamides. So, you know, I'm interested in not only methods to access these functional groups, but also manipulate them in complex settings such as the ones so shown here. For example, how could we functionalize a pyridine in this setting or functionalize a sulfonamide or make a phenol? Uh, sorry, I guess my pointer doesn't work. Um, make the you know phenol shown in the bottom right. And what I'll tell you about first is some independent research projects that I did while at Merck that were not related to process chemistry. So I'm a process chemist full time, but I do find um, some time in the day to develop new methods. And really where this all started is for the transformation shown here, which is the conversion of electron poor aryl halides to phenols. And at first glance, this looks like a trivial transformation. You say, oh, I can just take hydroxide and do SNAR to make the phenol. But in reality, that doesn't work. Hydroxide is a poor nucleophile, and the products are often more reactive uh, for SNAR. So um, you know, in my first year at Merck, I started talking uh, with a colleague of mine, Kevin Maloney, who uh, was next door to my office. And you know, we shared a lot of common interests, and one of them was developing new methods. And we both thought that this would be an interesting transformation. And you know, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll cut to the punchline is that we were able to develop what we're terming these hydroxide surrogate reagents. So in this instance, we developed reactions with acetohydroxamic acid, uh, which is shown in the box. And this reacts under mildly basic conditions because the LH bond is acidic and the oxygen anion is an excellent nucleophile. So you can run these reactions under mild conditions. The intermediate shown in the box then fragments itself under the same reaction conditions through a Lawson rearrangement to generate these phenols. So that's Kevin there uh, shown in the middle in the picture. And we published this in 2016. And it immediately um, took off internally, which I'll get back to in a second. There were some limitations of this. Of course, you need an electron poor uh, aryl halide coupling partner. Um, so we wanted to expand this more broadly. So we, we looked at palladium and copper catalyzed methods, but there was issues with this uh, reagent over its sensitivity and also the loss and rearrangement did not occur unless the aromatic uh, group was electron poor. Uh, so we went back to the drawing board and we ultimately developed this other hydroxide surrogate um, reaction using benzaldehyde oxime. We developed both palladium and copper catalyzed methods to allow for a really broad scope for the conversion of you know, electronically and sterically diverse aryl halides to phenols. And we published uh, two papers in 2017. And you know, really, you know, what excites me about doing these side projects is not only it's really fun to work with Kevin, who's a, you know, a great friend and, and colleague, but the fact that this chemistry has been used uh, extensively. Uh, so when I checked a few months ago, this was used uh, over 800 times at Merck so far, and it's used you know, on, a, on a daily basis, essentially. It's also been used in a couple cases on multi-kilo scale for the supply of clinical material, and it's routinely used across other farm industries. And it's also, um, been used in a, in a handful of cases in the academic setting. So for example, the alutidine total synthesis by uh, Greg Dudley. Um, I won't read the text here, but basically no other conditions work, but um, our hydroxide surrogate strategy worked. And if you want to hear more, I'll um, refer you to episode two of my colleagues uh, Farm to Table podcast. So this is a, a podcast put on by Elsie Campo, who's in the left on the photo up top, and then Danny Schultz, uh, two excellent colleagues. So I encourage you to check out their podcast. 
So switching gears, um, so I mentioned in the introduction that purities are extremely prevalent and you know, one of the most common heterocycles in pharmaceutical chemistry. So in grad school, I, I recognized this and um, was interested in developing methods for the selective functionalization of these. Um, so in 2013, I developed this method for the fluorination of purines using silver 2 fluoride, and these reactions occur with exquisite site selectivity and you know, really broad scope. And then the fluorinated products are okay as final products, but they're really versatile synthetic intermediates where you can do SNAR with a variety of nucleophiles. And, and this chemistry is great, but there are a few limitations, right? Use a stoichiometric silver. Silver 2 is a strong oxidant. It's a strong Lewis acid. So there are some issues with functional group compatibility. Um, so um, when I came to Merck, I, I was interested in developing maybe a more process-friendly uh, variant of this. Uh, so I, I developed this bifunctional reagent, which is shown in the box there, this um, oxine derivative. And the way this works is that it reacts with pyridines to make this to make the electrophilic uh, pyridinium salt, which is prone to nucleophilic addition. And then that intermediate can undergo uh, base-mediated um, re-aromatization, which in, um, reacts via the loss of acetonitrile and breaking the anode bond to generate uh, methane sulfonate. And then it's re-aromatize your pyridine to make these nucleophile substituted pyridines. And shortly after that, this was uh, commercialized by Sigma Aldrich and a few other vendors. Uh, so it's available for, for people around the world. Um, and, and this chemistry was uh, good. It was you know interesting from a mechanistic, me mechanistic point of view, but the substrate scope with respect to what nucleophile you can use was quite limited. And it was primarily limited to things like cyanide, for example. Um, so I had an extremely talented uh, intern. Or he was a graduate student at the time, Su Hong Kim, uh, come and work with me for the, for the summer in 2019. And we developed what we termed uh, the aminator, which kind of addresses some of the, the functional compatibility issues uh, in the previous paper. So this region is completely different, but it works in a, a similar fashion that it activates the pyridine ring, it has a two electron oxygen, and also delivers the nitrogen source. So I won't go into all the details or the, the mechanism. I'll leave that up to the audience to figure out, or you can uh, read this paper. Um, so again, switching gears to the, the third and final topic for the, the independent research projects is um, the late stage functionalization of sulfonamides. Of course, you know, molecular editing is, is a buzzword these days. So I think this really fits the bill. So you know, again, Kevin and I were just chatting one day and we were really interested in, in transformations such as the one shown here. How can you take for example, a primary sulfonamide in some complex setting that has multiple nitrogen heterocycles, multiple um, you know, basic functionality, and then selectively convert the NH2 group of a primary sulfonamide to things like sulfones, other sulfonamides, sulfonic acids, and so on and so forth. So of course, this looks impossible on paper, um, but you know, Kevin's an extremely creative guy, and you know, we, we put our, our minds together and came up with what I think is a, a pretty uh, interesting solution. So the general reaction mechanism shown here, we're able to take primary sulfonamides with benzaldehyde as a stoichiometric reductant. You form these sulfonyl imines transiently in situ, and then the NHC catalyst uh, breaks these down with the loss of benzonitrile. So benzaldehyde is oxidized benzonitrile, and your sulfonamide is reduced to a sulfonate, uh, which is shown in the box. And once you have these sulfonates, they're extremely versatile uh, intermediates, which can react with electrophiles, they can do desulfonylated cross-couplings, and so on and so forth. So through this um, pathway, we're able to do transformations such as the one shown here. For example, on the left, you can take this uh, fairly complex sulfonamide and selectively convert the NH2 group to a methyl group. And in the right-hand side, you can take Celebrex and convert the NH2 group um, to, for example, N15 NH2 for uh, labeling, which is important in, in drug discovery and development. And you can also do transformations that completely remove the sulf uh, sulfonyl group to generate, for example, biaryl compounds. And this work was also uh, scaled up to appreciable scale and uh, published in organic syntheses uh, last year. You know, so looking at this, um, this initial paper was focused on primary sulfonamides, but we wanted to look more broadly. How can we take, for example, any secondary sulfonamide and selectively functionalize any part of it that we want? For example, switching the sulfur for a carbon or cutting out nitrogen or switching any of the R groups in a late stage fashion. And, and again, at the time, this was completely unknown and it, it looks kind of silly on paper that this would even be proposed. Um, but again, long story short, and I'm cutting out some of the details in the interest of time, but we were able to develop conditions that allow for transformations such as the one I just showed. So you can see here in the bottom left, we can take this fairly complex sulfonamide and convert it into an amide by effectively replacing the SO2 group with the CO group. And on the bottom right-hand side, you can see that we take this N-methyl sulfonamide and convert it to a methyl sulfone, essentially excising uh, nitrogen from the molecule. And subtle changes like this are important in drug discovery where you want to make minor tweaks of a complex molecule to lead to new um, drug candidates. 
All right. So that was some of the, the independent research that I've done uh, while at Merck, uh, predominantly with uh, you know my friend and colleague, Kevin Maloney. But of course, I'm a process chemist um, by day. Um, and I, I was extremely honored to have been selected to lead the efforts uh, for the process chemistry side for molnupiravir, which is internally known as MK4042. Uh, so that's the compound shown in the top right, uh, this nucleoside derivative, and it's um, being investigated as an investigation, or it's being investigated as an antiviral for COVID-19. This is an orally dose drug, and the way it works is that the oxine functional group on the heterocycle can switch between two tautomeric forms. So in the oxine form, it can act like uridine, and in the hydroxylamine form, it can act like cytidine. So in the RNA polymerase uh, enzyme, this leads to viral error catastrophe by causing all these mutations. Um, and effectively killing the virus. So this is currently in phase three clinical trials. Um, the readout is expected imminently within the next few weeks. And the hope is that we would apply for emergency use authorization um, before the end of the year. And you know this has been all over the news. I'm sure you know, people have come across Molnupiravir. There was uh, the headline on CNN.com yesterday was about this drug. Um, it's, it's demonstrated very exciting antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2 in humans. And it has you know, really promising, um, or I guess it's very promising to help end the pandemic. So I won't go into all the details again in the interest of time, but there was two efforts for the Molnupiravir team. So one of them was what we refer to as Gen 1, the first generation synth synthesis where we, we start from uridine and there's a five-step synthesis to convert it to Molnupiravir. Uh, so we acquired a, a baseline process when we uh, partnered with Ridgeback to develop this uh, therapeutic and we had a few months to really improve the yields and make it a robust process so we could supply the world uh, with this drug. Um, so again, I, I won't go into the details, but over the five steps, we were able to improve the yield by a factor of 1.6 and improve overall throughput and productivity by a factor of two, meaning we can make twice as much material as we would have uh, otherwise. Uh, so this commercial process uh, has been completed and validated and implemented in five different countries. Uh, to date, we've made around 75,000 kilos of this drug, uh, which is around 350 million capsules for the treatment of uh, about 10 million people. Um, and this, this number is going up every day, um, about a metric ton per day uh, on average. And you know, we did a lot of improvements as well to uh, green chemistry, you know, with, it, or with an eye towards green chemistry to prevent waste. And the improvements and the scale is done on meaning, means that we're saving several millions of kilos of waste each year. And you know th this Gen 1 process is, is great. It's what's used to supply the world, but we also wanted to develop the ideal process. So the Gen 1 process starts from uridine, which is itself made from ribose and uracil. So we also came up with this uh, really short streamlined synthesis starting from ribose. Uh, there's an enzymatic serification with isobutyric anhydride to generate this non-isolated intermediate shown in the box. And then a, a really elegant biocatalytic cascade installs the uracil ring generate this isobutyl uridine intermediate as our only isolated intermediate. And I, I really can't take credit for really any of this work. This was the, done by my excellent colleagues in the biocatalysis protein engineering groups to develop this extremely elegant cascade and um, working with some process chemistry colleagues to figure out isolations in, in the process. And then this final step is it's quite elegant uh, dehydration method uh, developed uh, primarily by my colleague, Steve Silverman. Uh, to convert the carbonyl group into an oxine. And this occurs in, in high yield and using simpler reagents. So overall, compared to the, the baseline process, this is um, two thirds fewer steps and two and a half fold higher yielding. And it's approximately 50% cost of goods reduction. And thank you, Bethany, for highlighting this work um, earlier this year. And this, this paper should be published uh, imminently in the next uh, few days. Hopefully. So with that, um, I'll, I'll first thank all the colleagues that I worked with for Molnupiravir. It's a, a very large team of chemists, engineers, analytical chemists, and, and so on and so forth. These are, you know, this wouldn't have been possible without the team shown here. And it's really amazing to have been able to lead the process chemistry efforts and work with these uh, folks. And then, you know, on a more personal note, I'd like to thank the folks shown here. Uh, so Rebecca Green, uh, my incredible wife, who's dialed in. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Um, amazing uh, person to... Um, partnered with and really amazing scientists. Um, huge thanks to John Hartwig, who I think is also online. Hello, John. Um, amazing mentor. You know, he took this uh, Iowa farm boy and converted him to a, a scientist. So thank you, John. And my undergraduate advisor, uh, Siwon Kim, the co-inventor of the Aminator. And uh, Kevin, who I've already mentioned many times, is an incredible friend and, and colleague. And LC and, you know, the rest of the Merck leadership team, not only for supporting these independent research projects, 
but also for giving me the opportunity to lead uh, the moment of your chemistry teams. And of course, thank you again to anyone who nominated me and for selecting me for the, the Talented 12. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, as you pointed out, I've been following the uh, Molten Peer Revier synthesis, and I was just wondering if um, you know there's any plans to move forward with the Gen 2 process. Very good question. Yes, so at, as of right now, there are not the plans because we are committed to making so much material with Gen 1, we've already made so much that from the forecast, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but the pandemic is, you can't predict it, right? So if, if demand goes up, if you know this really is going to be used heavily, then there is the potential that we would re revisit Gen 2. So we kind of parked it in a place that is such that we could easily restart it and validate it for commercial manufacturing. Thank you so much.